Well, this is the second week of our Love Is series, and uh, last week we covered, we're not cover loving God, but in about 24 minutes we did that. Uh, and this is the second part of Matthew 22 where Jesus is challenged, really, to try to trap him uh, to answer what are the greatest commandments. And his answer is this in Luke, or Matthew 22. Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. So if you think about the Ten Commandments, things like do not murder, well, that's certainly uh, not loving your neighbor, is it? Uh, Coveting, that's not loving your neighbor. That's not loving God. Adultery, that's not loving your neighbor. That's not loving God. Worshiping idols, that's certainly not loving God. Bearing false witness, that's certainly not. You know, you can see a theme here, right? He's showing us that underneath this thread that runs through those Ten Commandments, it truly does summarize all of those things. It doesn't doesn't nullify the Ten Commandments, but it it really shows that it is all should be done by love. Now, when we talk about loving your neighbor, I'm I'm a bit of a list maker. I don't know about y'all. I do a thing called a Monday morning brain dump, if you've ever tried this, uh, where you simply just list out everything you can think of that is getting your mind down and you need to know you need to accomplish. And if it doesn't get on the list, many times it might not get done. Uh, It's really about the power of priority, of prioritizing things as best you can to get things done. Clearly church today was your priority. And it made me think about the first time I ever flew on an airplane. It was 1992 and uh, I flew from Raleigh to Buffalo, New York because I had a friend that lived in Canada. And so they were going to come pick me up, and I was going to spend a week in Canada. And so I get on the airplane, and I just felt so fancy. I was like, business class? Does this mean I'm a businessman, you know? How cool is this? Um, there is a phone in the back of the seat, and you could pick it up and pay 12 bucks a minute or whatever it was to call someone. You know, I mean, you could walk right up to the gate. Remember that? There's like no security pretty much. People are smoking, like... It was like a different universe compared to today. Um, You know, and then I remember this too. On a flight to Buffalo, it was not a very long flight. They served me a meal. They don't do that anymore. (laughs) You might get some pretzels. Uh, Chicken piccata and broccoli. I remember it this very day. Thanks, Delta. But you know, when you fly... (laughs) And they probably don't do this anymore. It's usually a video now or an audio thing. But then it was a stewardess or a flight attendant, excuse me. And they would hold up the seatbelts, right? And say, this is how you put on a seatbelt. And they help you explain that to you. And they say, in case we're all panicking, these are the exits, right? This is how you get off this place. And then they said something really weird. In the event of a depressurization of the cabin, oxygen masks will descend, I'm like, oh, this is reassuring. But then they said, if you have a small child, put the mask on yourself first. I thought, are these people sadists? What are you you talking about? You should put it on the kid first. No, clearly, I had the the adult has to do first what the child could not, right? if, if If I'm struggling to breathe, they certainly can't get there either. You, and in many ways, you can't give away what you don't already possess. In terms of prioritization, in order for both of us to survive and to live, that had to happen first. You can't share something you haven't experienced, right? And when we talk about loving God and loving your neighbor, it starts, certainly starts with basking in the love of God. So then you have something to share with your neighbor and the world around you. Much of the Christian life is a lifelong reordering of our loves, a reprioritization of our loves. And with God's help, of course, in the right priority. Jesus says, when you love God first, you are then able to equally do this other equally important commandment, which is love your neighbor as yourself. There's a writer named Augustine, who's uh, one of the church fathers from 354 to 430, Uh, He was actually a bishop, and he wrote a lot about this theme of prioritization of love, of reordering our loves, and it's a a thread through much of his writing and his, his thoughts, and he said things like this, 
love of God is the first to be commanded, but love of neighbor is the first to be put into practice. So what he's saying is, yes, you can love God, but that's such an immaterial, unseen exercise, right? It's a very personal thing. You can't quantify that. So, like, others can't perceive that happening in your life, loving God, right? So how in the world could they know? You, you, you can't be like, hey, don't bother me right now, neighbor. I'm trying to love God, right? Don't, don't, I don't need that right now. Give me a minute, okay? Can't you see that? No, he's saying, if you're going to be loving God, the only way people will see it is how you love your neighbors, right? Ultimately, the fruit of it is that. He goes on to say, since you did not see God, you merit the vision of God by loving your neighbor. By loving your neighbor, you prepare your eye to see God. St. John sees clearly, if you do not love your brother whom you see, how will you love God whom you do not see? And he's quoting 1 John 4 there. When first things are put first, second things are not suppressed, but they're actually increased. I see this a lot in churches over the years. Um, some people in a family will go to church, some people don't. Some people, they're like, eh, I'd rather watch golf or, or work in the yard or something. And Because they think, if I do that, the rest of my life will be suppressed. I don't get that, but that's a mentality some people have. But no, Jesus is saying here, if you put first things first, second things are actually increased. They're not suppressed. If you make it a priority. But someone's thinking, I'm sure, that sounds great, but I would love for you to try and love my neighbors. Okay, pastor dude? If, if you knew my Aunt Edna or my crazy cousin, you would, not, you would not be able to love these people, okay? And true, there are some people you meet who just seem unlovable. Or maybe to others, you're unlovable. I don't know. But in every one of those instances, as challenging as it might be, you have an opportunity. For example, when I feel impatient, I have an opportunity to learn patience. When I feel challenged to love an unlovable person, it's an opportunity, right, to grow and to learn about the hard work of love. I have a million dollar Christian t-shirt idea, so if I have any benefactors, it's this. God loves you and I'm trying. I know I've used that before, but it's too good to forget. Loving God, I mean, that you can do in your bedroom. That's, that's great. But the whole loving your neighbor part, then it gets personal. It gets hard. And, uh, you know, because God doesn't make clones. Everybody's their own animal. Everyone's not like you or not like me. So the first step to loving neighbor is to realize, just to accept the person as they are, ultimately. Because if you start a, a, a friendship with an agenda, that's not a friendship. That's manipulation. And no one has ever had a change of heart by being manipulated. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus goes into more detail about loving neighbor, where he says, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do, do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, your reward will be great, and you're, you'll be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Merciful. The first point I made from that is, essentially, we love God as much as the person you like least. I know that's kind of hard to hear sometimes, because there's certainly people we don't like very much. <laughs> but... Ultimately, there's, there's a servant-hearted attitude that he's saying here is to be merciful, even as your father is merciful. The, the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, Bill Bright, uh, it's, it's a huge campus ministry around the world. He told a story of working in their offices in Orlando, and he had a coworker that he did not get along with. He just didn't like this guy, even though he hired him at some point. Um, and they just didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things. And he was so frustrated about it. And then one day he just kept praying about it and for this person. And, and then he realized, you know what? I can love this guy by faith. Even though I don't feel it, I don't feel the love for this person. 
I can do so by faith. I can trust God to meet me in the middle of that and help me love him, even though I don't want to and I don't feel it. And he said, when I started to unlock that, it helped that relationship heal because um, God's love helped me realize that. Now, Jesus didn't say the person you are, the person you love and forgive or lend to, he doesn't say those people are going to return the favor, right? It doesn't, that's not guaranteed. The people you forgive, they might not, still not like you. That's okay. That's not up to you, what they do with it. Love them anyway. But I'm going to leave a caveat to this passage in Luke chapter 6. Because over the years, I've met um, a number of people in churches who are good Christian people, and they really want to practice this idea of forgiving of enemies, loving your neighbor. And they, they, they will remain in abusive relationships thinking they have to. Um, it's like they're cross to bear. And I just wanted to say that I think in this instance, that is not what Jesus is saying. I think if you're in an abusive marriage or dating relationship, I think you should maybe get out of it. Can I get an amen, please? Because sometimes we mean well, but he doesn't mean you're a doormat. There's someone to walk all over you. Because, yes, be merciful to those who are merciful, but also maybe distance yourself. You can forgive them and love them. Like, I once I counseled a guy whose father was like super abusive. And we came to the realization, I was like, look, dude, you can love your dad but, and, and honor his position in your life, but you don't have to accept his behavior, okay? That's not what we're talking about with loving our enemies or loving your neighbors. Um, and that's, that's a delicate thing. That's a, that's a delicate um, needle, you know, to thread there. But I just think it's important to, to mention that. So if it's at the expense of personal abuse, I, I do not think that is the case here. Then thirdly, Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, have a heavenly focus. He points to the Father in heaven as the example. He says, be merciful as your Father in heaven is merciful. God is the model of the example here. So do what you see God doing, just as Jesus saw what, did what he saw the Father doing. Go back to the source of love. Go back to the source of mercy. Go back to the source of loving your neighbor, which is God, ultimately. As C.S. Lewis said, chase the sunbeam back into the sun. But don't look at the sun. I don't recommend that. You'll, you'll go blind. But, you know, he said, he's saying, look at the example of God as the example for how we love our neighbor, ultimately. You know, have you ever heard that quote, don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good? Have you ever heard that before? I always hated that quote. I just think it makes no sense. I get what you're saying. You're, 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 with your boots on the ground, you know, and your, your head's in the clouds, you're not going to be able to help the word. I disagree. I, I don't think we're heavenly minded enough sometimes. I, I think actually Jesus was extremely heavenly minded. And the more heavenly minded you are, the more earthly good to your neighbor you'll actually be. Because when first things are put first, second things are not suppressed, but increased. The biggest obstacle to loving a neighbor could also be just internal brokenness. It could be history. It could be past relationships that have been so devastatingly difficult. Um, but for some of us, the person you like least could be yourself. It could be an internal thing. And it's hard to get over that. It's hard to get through that, to, to break through those barriers. Um, before you can truly love your neighbor, some of us have to receive God's healing love for ourselves first. You can't give away what you don't already have. Uh, so I saw this stat graph this week, and it really just got my attention. I don't think I'm Gen Z anymore. I'm definitely not Gen Z. I think I'm more like Gen X. I don't know what I am. I don't really care anymore, but I saw this stat and I've always known this about people younger than me, that depression and anxiety is absolutely spiking in our country, especially with working with teenagers for so long. I knew it's the truth. But then I saw this graph, and there's sources to this I can supply. But there's, it has literally more than doubled in the past 10 years. This idea of, of anxiety and depression has skyrocketed among 
people in their teens, 20s, and 30s, and I mean all age groups, but especially in those age groups. Now, there's a lot of reasons for this rise. Um, one, I think, is digital communication and how we, the medium in many ways of our culture has become the message and how we communicate with each other dictates how we feel. And you can easily get your feelings hurt really quick um, on social media, you just can. Uh, you get misunderstood really fast. And I mean, that's part of it. But what, I've, what you've heard many counselors say over the years, if you've been to counseling, is that hurt people tend to hurt people. And we carry the wounds of the past, the baggage of the past, and how we treat other people around us. And sometimes this is not your fault. Sometimes it's what other people did to you. But millions and millions of people are under attack, is what I'm trying to say. Absolutely under attack. Um, Many of the stats, I think many of the people in these sort of statistics are also believers. I think they're also Christians. And I think we have to remove the stigma of mental health uh, even more. I mean, I think it is tied to spiritual health in many ways. We're holistic beings. Our whole selves are not just emotion, but we are. Your soul is a big part of that. But I think it's okay for you to hear, for you to say to God, for you to say to others, um, I'm not okay. I need help, I need healing, I need the love of God more in my life, I need to experience it more first. And that's why, you can take that down now, that's why so many revivals in history, one of their common themes is it's people simply basking in the love of God. It's simply people not wanting to leave God's presence. The revivals that that were part of the Methodist history for so many years, thousands of people, I mean, they were coming for the presence of God. They weren't coming for a show. They weren't coming to be entertained. They were coming to experience the love of God. Why? Because we're broken. Do you think people back then didn't feel the depression and anxiety? Of course they did. But because deep down, our deepest need is to know that we are loved. I think loneliness may be the biggest epidemic in the world and that people feel they're alone. They feel they're, they're, they're beyond hope, that you're listening to voice of fear. You know, these sort of lies that people hear, like, like you're permanently broken, or that last relationship didn't work out, so therefore you're cursed for the next one, or I, I failed in this uh, thing with my children, and I'm never going to overcome it. You could go on and on and on, that you're too far gone. But do you know what all those lies have in common? They keep you from the love of God. They're lies that try to replace the truths of God. This is what the enemy likes to do with people. Oh, he loves it, by the way. He takes things that are sacred, and he desacralizes them. He takes things that are important to the heart of God and twists them. It's very manipulative, of course. He's really good at it. Like, your personality, your soul, is sacred to God. He wants to remind you of things that aren't true about yourself. He wants to lie to you to make you not believe the truths of God's word. Like, what did he say to Eve in the Garden of Eden? Is that really what God said? Right? Is that really what he said? Just take, you can eat the apple, it's okay. You know, he, he's, he's, so, he's so crafty about it, but... The devil wants to cut us off from the source of the love of God. But hear these words of 1 John 4, 4. Little children, you are from God and have conquered the world. For the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Greater is he than is the one that is in the world. The greater is the power of Christ within you than is greater than any false label you could ever hear about your life. That that's one of the great the pieces of the good news of the gospel is that we can be temples of the Holy Spirit where the presence of God can live within us forever and be made new creations and be born again and to be reminded that the perfect love of God casts out all fear. You know, earlier I spoke about the power of priority and, and prioritizing the love of God and love of neighbor in our lives. If you read Augustine, so much of his work 
is prayers. He's praying as he's writing. Well, why, why does he do that? Because he knew that he can't reorder his heart on his own strength. He knew he needs the grace and the love of God to help him do that. That's why every sentence he ever wrote many times was prayers, because he's dependent on the grace of God to help him do that, to reorder his loves, to heal the brokenness of his past. Oh, Augustine had a very broken past, by the way. Uh, You could, uh, uh, huge. So that's why he prayed things like this. O love ever burning, never quenched. O charity, my God, set me on fire with your love. You command me to be content. Give me the grace to do as you command and command me to do what you will. This is really a prayer of awakening. You're praying to God, God, awaken me to the truth of your love. Whatever expectation you have for the love of God, whatever that limit is in your mind, it is greater than that. Whatever limit you go beyond that, he is greater than that. Greater is he that's in you that is in the world. Greater is he that's in you than what you experienced in your past. You can't change the past, but you can change the future with the love of God in your life. And as we grow in love with God, we become better at loving people. And we actually get closer to God, I think, when we start loving our neighbors as ourselves. But this is really a prayer of awakening because these prayers are important because circumstances change. You could get a phone call tomorrow and have a total different job situation or have to move or who knows what could happen. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. And even Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. Like today is enough problems of its own. Isn't that a good word from Jesus? <laughs> don't worry about tomorrow. You can't change that, but what you can't change is today. Today's enough of its own. So it's about prioritizing today what's most important. Maybe it's not what you're going to do this year, but what will we do today? And I want to ask you to pray with me. And I'm going to pray over you for God to help you continue to reprioritize your loves in your life. So I invite you to close your eyes and to pray with me. Holy Spirit, I pray that you move in the hearts of your people here and those at home. Lord, we thank you for your holy presence and the ways, God, you are you desire to continually be making us new. God, I pray over all the people here. And I just want to say, if that's you in the room, and, and, and this has resonated with you on some level, would you raise your hand? No one's going to see it. Just that you, you're saying to God, God, I need you to reprioritize my love. I've been loving all the wrong things. Thank you. I've been loving all the wrong things. And therefore, my love of neighbor has suffered. It has been conditional. I've been, we've been selfish. I think all of us can qualify under that. Thank you, God, that your love breaks us out of those molds. You break us out of ourselves. You get us out of our own head. And you move us in compassion to the world around us. God, I pray you bless these friends here. Holy Spirit, may they fall in deeper love with you and see that your love is unending and inexhaustible, always readily available. And just as you make us new this day, it can carry over into our relationships, into our futures. Thank you, God, that you indeed are making all things new. Move in our hearts so that we grow in compassion to the world around us. In Jesus' name.